recording? Okay, group number one, we were talking about aspirational capital, and that in a nutshell is hopes and dreams. What are your students' aspirations? What are your family's aspirations? Um, it, it typically, these students have high, educa high educational aspirations despite having persistent educational inequities. So I think that's really important to remember that they still have goals, they still have things they want to do, they still have aspirations, but they're up against these roadblocks. So then the questions that we were asking ourselves are, with regard to these aspirations, how are we supporting the growth of our students and their goals and their dreams, and what assumptions do we have of those goals and dreams? So, Okay, so in order to be able to support them, uh, we think the most important is to build relationship of trust between school and family or between teacher and the students. And also we try to find and nurture their strength to encourage their improvement. Besides, we still believe we need to encourage uh, executive uh, functioning. And uh, what assumption do we have? Uh, so we think well, we assumed every student have dream, and every family uh, have their expectation on the kids. And we also assume, or we also should believe that students and parents, they do want to live a good life. So that's all. Thank, Thank you. you. Group Thank number two. You. Is joining us. I really and she's going to explain what the capital is. I read this. <laughs> well, article I did. Two weeks ago. That's like a long time ago. That's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> You're first. You explain what linguistic capital is. Um, okay, so linguistic capital is using all the different registers, all the different ways that a voice can be used um, to express yourself or to complete a task or something like that. And the article talks about how the students. A lot of our students of color come from very rich linguistic capital because they have a history of storytelling and passing on their history that way. So some supports that we give in class that we can use are allowing students to answer things verbally because that very likely could be how they feel most comfortable. Um, and then multiple uses of content and language. Let them choose how, to, how they're going to do some assignments. Let them choose how they want to give the feedback and then we also talked about how they can benefit so much from um, taking what we share with them and going home and sharing it with their family. So that process of translating it as well can, can help to build that linguistic capital. Um, for inclusion, we kind of talked a little bit about um, this is an easy application in elementary school because um, their story time, music, um, it's very easy to talk about um, cultural um, different types of celebrations but going into that a little bit a little bit deeper and um, also increasing it in a social a socialization as well perfect awesome. thank you give it up for them group number three I just feel like we're fabulous on some linguistic <laughs> 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 a few more every <laughs> family, the families they've created, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, um, this idea that kids are going to take what they've learned and what they've been used to into this classroom and then even after high school. So how does that play a role and how do we accept what their family might look like or engage with that versus our assumptions of a family looks like the box, right? Mm -hmm. um, and their different perspectives. So we have the social and personal human resources in like a pre-college environment. So thinking about what they're around, experience you know, cultural knowledge, and like that dense community of history that they have. Um, also we read about how campuses could provide a network in college to kind of leverage in more of that positive environment, including cultures and kind of becoming like a, a family to them. Um, we looked at drawing um, to 
recognize and draw on wisdom, values, stories from their homes. So recognizing, like you were saying earlier, that families look different for everyone. All families have wisdom, stories, and values to carry on and to extend to their families. Yeah. And just that we as teachers can pull from that and make those connections and link everything together. Um, we also are saying how sometimes it feels like we have to do these big monumental things, but I think just including the parents in, what are you, what is my kid learning this week in school? And letting them be a part of it and just, hey, that we're talking about, like I just finished color. We're talking about color today, to interior design. To ask your kid about it, right? The color wheel or whatever it is that they can have some say in that. And then maybe that sparks conversations with their parents. Right, so we also talked about how do we create those environments that honor and invite families to participate. So we talked about those community events um, where families can come around and talk about common issues that they have so they don't feel so isolated or alone. And then we talked about just teachers doing simple things like going to those community events and how excited your students get to see you. And that just brings such a huge connection then into the classroom because they're like, oh, I saw you there. And I think that when you get to know your students, then that helps to create that sense of belonging, which kind of ties in with the whole family aspect. Give it up. Woo! essentially being able to use the network that you have um, in order to achieve whatever you're going for. It can be used in a variety of ways and we all do that regularly but it can be even harder for English language learners um, and the basic concept this is theoretically people lifting others while they climb up the mountain. <laughs> Um, so for your network, it could be, we used example of like community resources, maybe your peers, um, and, oh my gosh, <laughs> and um, um, one example I was, that really stood out to me was um, thinking about how students, how they are adapted into the classroom and adopted into the classroom, because what, if they feel like really accepted or if they really understand what's going on, then they can really excel. And then, huh. <laughs> we also included some examples that we have learned about in this class of things that can help students further their education and they can learn about these things through their family, their friends, their community resources. And we talked about the Dream Center, Women of the World, Latinos in Action, and then that can all be super powerful in a parent meeting. I mean, that made sense. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I got distracted by the papers attacking me. Um, I don't know if you already said this, but yeah, the lifting while you climb is just kind of um, as, it, you know, whatever group or groups you may belong to, as you kind of climb up that social capital ladder, you don't just leave kind of everyone in the dust. You use what you've learned to kind of reach back to them and make sure that you're lifting them up as well as you progress up that. So this can look like finding resources for getting scholarships, getting into certain programs or certain job placements, same way we all use. But then sharing those once you learn about them. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yes. Yeah. Give it up. Okay, just number five. Grab some snacks and I'll take a Okay. <laughs> institutions, uh, even ones that are unsupportive or and or hostile. So institutions like the high, um, elementary, middle school, high school, and our co Most wonderful school. colleges and <laughs> <laughs> things like that. <laughs> yeah, and we've talked about how um, in a lot of ways we set up those navigational supports in our schools already, which is good. We try to help, especially in middle school and high school, since we both do secondary, um, our, our students and parents meet with counselors to make plans to look at um, you know future classes that they should sign up for in the following year and then how to fill out their their you know registration card and, and all of those things that we take for granted that we know how to, that you just you fill out a card well 
especially for our EOL students and different students, that's, that's completely foreign. So just providing those supports. And I think some schools do this really well. Hillcrest does this really well. They're like, what happens when they come in and they need something like? Well, we have people in the offices that speak the different languages. Mm -hmm. And Which we have amazing. people that run around and have different jobs that are there, you know, they search down students and, you know, um, are there to support them or in an app. Uh, we have a vice principal that um, they're there, just there for the EL students. Mm. And they're for and translation you know, services yeah, for you and for the we, students. Yeah, yeah, and some of the people are, yeah, we can mm. use them for our IEPs for translation and things like that, which is really nice to have an inside in house translator. Um, uh, we've also used our um, language teachers since we have people that teach Spanish and Chinese and different things. We can call on them to help us translate for different things depending on what we need. So and part of it is acknowledging that a lot of structures still are unsupportive or have been set up to be unsupportive and, and hostile in a way for any underserved or underprivileged groups. Um, and so we decided that we don't think that our public schools are hostile or unsupportive. I think we try to use as many supports as possible, mm -hmm. but we do worry about our kiddos when they get to a college level. Those structures are pretty unsupportive. People are on their own. You have to really be an individual who advocates for themselves and if you're already also trying to struggle with language acquisition it and all of that. It can be hostile to us. It's so hostile to us. We're, to... <laughs> we're frustrated. So how would it be for everyone else? Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's disjointed, but we also mentioned and talked about like the Dream Center and those um, areas on campus where kids and, and you know people can come together as more of a community to support. So. To help navigate the system. Yeah. Now, well, when I think people, I awesome. think sometimes even individuals can be yeah. unsupportive. Yeah. Right, so, like, right. And it the, just, even if the institution is good, sometimes that individual can be a roadblock. So yeah. Being able to navigate that. Yeah. Yeah. Woo, give it up. Awesome. <laughs> Trying to figure out who to go to and where to go and everybody has to yeah. I'll, I'll, in just a minute, I'll turn to Love or Bad. There's, there's some article, just highlights in this article. Group number six. Woo. Woo, get it Woo. up. Woo. Here comes resistance. <laughs> <laughs> students who are committed to engaging in and serving their home communities and I, I just want to read that first and back up a little bit because the article did talk about specific things such as African-American mothers that teach their daughters um, through verbal and nonverbal lessons um, to assert themselves or to um, be intelligent or beautiful or strong or worthy which they're coming off as the resistors in the communities and then it goes into the the article about talking about why don't in a prom dem like predominantly predominantly maybe African American area why aren't we doing research to find out what our area is what those resistors are what the culture is about why aren't we researching what our area is about why are we teaching our schools and our school settings about these things especially if it's um, the dominant in the area and why aren't they being implemented into the school instead of becoming resistors, especially in those predominant areas. So uh, as we are teachers with our, our students in our community, all our diverse students and everybody that's included in our community, why can't we take what our students are learning from their families and incorporate it into our style? I mean, we want to raise our children. They are beautiful. They are, so we do support them and we want them to be respectful to each other and so we can incorporate what they're bringing into our classrooms, I think that we can do that easily. Um, by the opportunities, we're engaging our families in our classrooms, we're letting them know what we're learning about, we're including them always in with us, with us. learn some culture backgrounds, cultural differences with all our children that are in our classroom. I mean, I don't think that's a really hard thing to do, I think that's a, an interesting thing to do, a really interesting thing to do. Um, invite culture into our schools and our classrooms, I mean, I overheard Whitney talk about having um, um, like a luncheon or a get together or barbecue that she's planning for her future students, I mean, or her current students in April. I mean, that's such an easy thing to do that we can incorporate and we've learned a lot in this, this whole unit of um, ESL that we can incorporate into our classrooms. Okay, thank you everyone.